Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great, great pleasure to see all of you gathered here for the public registration organized by uh, Institute of Engineers, Sri Lanka. First of all, I would like to invite uh, Professor Mrs. Niranjali Ratnayaka, the president of IESL, to welcome all of you. Thank you, and uh, it is indeed a pleasure to welcome all of you. Uh, uh, this was publicized quite uh, well, but I was having doubts with the you, terrible weather outside, whether uh, we'll be able to get a uh, participation. But thank you very much for coming despite the bad weather. I'm sure you will not be disappointed because uh, engineer uh, Amarathunga. Uh, has a, a really good message to give all of us. Uh, so uh, he is going to talk about legacy of a transport project, how engineers could contribute to develop a nation. So it is about us, how we can contribute to the national development and it is very opportune. A lot of things are happening in the country where engineers have to play a major role and I am sure the uh, experiences of uh, uh, Dr. Amaratunga is going to uh, help us in uh, uh, at least uh, you know, getting some idea of how we can proceed with our uh, work and uh, assist the country to develop more and more. So uh, I don't want to take up much time, uh, I think uh, so that will be uh, introduced by the, the yeah, uh, secretary. Um, I, I congratulate the two sectional committees who are jointly organizing this uh, civil engineering sectional committee and the mechanical engineering sectional committee. And I am sure we will have a, a good, good stuff to take home after the uh, after the presentation, only thing I have to tell you to excuse me because there is a clashing with a meeting that I am supposed to be chairing downstairs, so I have to go for that. But I am sure so that being one of my former students, uh, uh, I am sure he will keep you entertained. Happy listening. Thank you very much, Madam. Now it's my uh, pleasure again to introduce the presenter today, Engineer Sarat, uh, Engineer Sugat Vartanga. Engineer Sugat is a member of the Australian Senior Public Service with valuable experience in major construction, infrastructure development, and business management. He's working as a senior rail professional for the unit present and infrastructure group of IFN SW. Engineer Suga graduated from University of Morocco in civil engineering and is a chartered civil engineer. He holds an MBA from Uni UTS Sydney. Engineer Suga demonstrated skills in his long illustrious career, career including project design leadership, conflict resolutions, presentation skills. Actually, Engineer Sukat is a, an international speaker in more than 20 rail conferences. Further to that, uh, financial management and change management skills, stakeholder management skills and business case development and project evaluation skills. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Engineer Sukar Amritunga to deliver the presentation.
Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today, I think I can see a few of my good old colleagues, my schoolmates here, my uh, uni mates, university mates, and um, yeah, a couple of professionals. Before going into this presentation, um, may I ask a few questions? How many engineers are here? Please raise your hands. Any non-engineers? Okay, good. One, two. Right, I can see. Right. So, when I say engineer, don't think it's relevant only to engineers. It's relevant to professionals. That's what I mean. Keep that in mind. Okay. But however, since it's an institution of engineers, I'm going to use the term engineer. Keep that in mind. All right. So. Okay, so because since we are engineers, we know, most of us know, we, um, we build buildings, uh, railway stations, hospitals, roads, all of us know that. But have you ever thought we are part of this, we are actually on a battle to develop a nation? Have you ever thought of it? This is a message I'm going to give you. We are not just uh, constructing buildings. We are not just building roads, we are not building stations or hospitals, we are developing a nation. But we need to remember that, don't forget that. So that's a big picture, we can't forget that. So you need to always connect with the big picture. Right. Okay, let's start. I think I don't, need not tell who this is, right? This is what he says, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them right for an example i'm going to talk of a project let's say railway station built in 19th century 150 years ago we want to develop can we have the same thinking and do it no we can't do it we need to think in an innovative way in a new manner right we have to do that so we need to do that keep that in your mind right so I'm going to talk of this project, specific project. I think few of you may have seen that. I'm pretty sure Arjun has seen that. Okay, few of my colleagues here have seen this station. This has been built. This is a very old station built in 1870 in Sydney, in one of the suburbs. The suburb is known as Schofield. Um, there was this uh, British convict by the name. John Schofield. He was evicted or uh, he was sent to Sydney as a punishment in somewhere around 1840s. So what happened was he developed his skills there while working. He became an entrepreneur. He built his empire. He became a businessman. Right? Finally, he was living in this suburb of Schofields. And he realized, okay, his timber mill, he has no way of transporting. But however, the rail line, the Richmond line was passing, bordering his property. He offered his land, he built his station. Okay, fair enough. He built so many millions after that with that. That's how they built this Scofield station. And this is that station. And you can see it very well. It is a single track. And during peak hours, you can run two trains per hour. That's a maximum, nothing else. That's a maximum. So, if you go to train to catch eight o'clock train, and if you miss it by a minute, you have to wait half an hour because it's peak hour. If you go around ten o'clock, you have to wait for one hour to go to Sydney. As well, the travel time from Schofields to Sydney was one hour twenty twenty-five minutes that time. So that was the problem. So as a result. This Schofield suburb was isolated. No one is going to build a new house there. Not many employment opportunities. Crime rate was high. And no new business opportunities. As a result, um, if you talk about the family income, family income was just around $35,000 per year, which is at the low one-third end in Sydney. So it's a poor suburb in one word, single word. It's a poor suburb. So what was the issue? Main issue we identified the transport. Because people need to have transport. 
the facilities to transport. So we need to do that, right? These are a few pictures, old Scofield suburb. I have, uh, we, uh, we have taken these photographs, right? And this was the, the city, the town there, suburban town. It's a lonely suburb, not many people, but the crime rate was very high. Right, then, there was this plan came up to duplicate this rail line, so from Quaker City to Schofield, right? And the circle area is actually, we guess this will be the area which will be developed, which will follow a growth, economic growth after the station. So we had that in our big picture, we had that. So what was our project scope? This project was known as Richmond Line Duplication Project. So scope was approximately 4,200 meters of new track. That's a duplicated new line. Then when you do that, you have to stabilize your embankment. Then you need to lay your combined service route. And we need to provide maintenance access route as well. Project, developing project is not just delivering the project. We need to think of future. How are, going to, how are they going to do the maintenance? Is that a maintenance access route? For you to take heavy trucks, whatever that meet the requirements. You need to plan out. So that's part of the project. That's part of the project cost as well. That's how we plan future projects, any project. Then the new traction substation. As well, relocating Schofield station with car parking. The old car, um, station had only 12 car parks available one day. When we build it, now we realize, no, we need at least 700 to meet the next 20 years requirement. But however, we didn't have the capacity to provide all those 20 um, um, uh, 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 car parks. What we did was we provided around 180 car parks straight away. And the balance, we allocated the land. When the need comes, you can build multi-story car park close to the station. And the relocating, we had to relocate that station by 800 meters more towards Sydney. The reason was, we realized if you want to create economic growth, we need some space. We need to uh, uh, locate the station in a strategic location so that the economic growth could follow. The shopping complexes should come close to the station, business parks, all those things. If you set up. If you just upgraded the existing station, there's no space around that to develop that new city. So we realized that. But however, there was some objection from the people as well as the politicians around that. I will come into that later on. And the, still the scope, uh, new substations, overhead wiring, signaling systems, um, as well when you widen your rail track, you need to set up uh, develop new culverts, stormwater system, new pedestrian footbridge. Now, earlier I told you, during off-peak, only one train runs per hour. So people can just cross the rail line, no danger, because people know it in, in identified locations. But can we do that in future? When a train runs on every seven and a half minutes, can you do it? No. People's life is in danger. So we need to identify. Either we should go for a pedestrian footbridge, overhead bridge, or a subway, we need to take the decision on those locations. So we had that in our plan. So landscaping, noise mitigation, when the new rail line comes, the noise to the neighboring residences will become high, noise levels will increase. How do we manage it? So we need we have to find a solution. So we had all those. It's a complete project, it's a holistic approach. Not only just put in two rail lines and a new station, no. So we had to connect with the future economic growth as well as is a theory and that's some theory we have learned in engineering. Whatever the improvement we do, we can't add more hassles or the risks to the people. We can't do that. We need to manage it as well. So we did that in um, style. The project cost was $236 million. Right. So we did that project. First of all, I'm trying to give the big picture. What is the change we did? So, once the project was completed, the project was opened on um, 28th of October 2012, several years ago, but it's a historic project. That's why I'm taking it as a um, case study. So, after that, now, we run eight trains per 
each way per hour. So if you miss the train nowadays, you have to wait only seven and a half minutes. And the travel time, if you catch the express train during off peak, during peak or off peak, it's only 50 minutes. Travel time to Sydney. Early it was one hour to around one hour 25 minutes. So now you can see the classy new station. Okay. And this is the aerial view of the station. Okay. Uh, the color of that roof we selected to re um, remind people of the old workshops we had in that area. So we did, um, pick, um, fix that color to remind the people of that. So this is a new station. And can you see the new development taking place? Already, uh, during these few years, at least 4,000 new house and houses have been built and the target is I think by 2020 there will be 10,000 new houses will be built in that area as well new shopping complexes new business parks yeah you can see them right and it's a really busy <coughs> suburb nowadays and the best thing is now today according to the latest statistics Earlier, the, the family income was around $35,000 per year. Now today, it has hit above $90,000. Okay. So, so many new families have come, income levels gone up, new business sparks, new employment opportunities, um, new private schools as well as government schools, so many opportunities. So, do you agree with me now? We don't just build stations. We create economic growth. Are you with me? But if we didn't realize that initially, and if we wanted to build just a station, do you think it will happen? No. Then we would have just easy solution was to keep the station as it is, just upgrade. I am pretty sure. If we did that, this economic growth wouldn't have happened. No way. So we created that. So we should be proud as engineers. Remember, whatever the projects you do, I mean, don't forget, you should be proud about what you have delivered to give that economic growth to the nation. You are part of that process. Don't forget that. All right, to do that, bit of engineering as well. So do that. We had these engineering studies. So it's um, geotechnical investigations. You know about it, detailed surveys pedestrian modeling so we did a really good pedestrian modeling using using a static curve modeling as well as dynamic modeling um, use the fruit uh, model um, to estimate what kind of people how many people are going to use this station for the next 20 years based on our assumptions and the flood study remember when you do a project always flood levels the risks of having more floods will increase so how do we manage it uh, do we have enough flood basins how do we solve it so we had to alert the necessary authorities. This is a project coming up. Let's do it together. So we had our plans. We had to sell that plans, right? We did that in STAR. The noise assessment studies, as well as future needs studies, which I'm going to talk later on few innovative things we did and how we saved so many dollars, millions of dollars for the government by having a future needs study. Right. And we deliver this project on this alliance model normally we are we engineers are used to giving a direct contract so what happens contractor right throughout fight with us fight with the client okay this part of the scope is not there so all those issues are there right throughout the, this journey it's a battle big battle so we want to eliminate that battle and work as a team now who were the part the transport of New South Wales, that's a government body, SKM designers, Leighton contractors, ACOM designers, MVM rail, uh, they are rail experts, and Saldo, they are signaling people. So we formed an alliance. And there were few alliances, actually. They competed for the project. So we selected, we had so many days of interviews with different parties. We spent and we selected a okay, Richmond Line Alliance will be the winner. This is the uh, co cost of the project. It was 236 million. Then you might ask, what's the difference? Right? What's the difference between this alliance and the normal contract we operate? Let's see. Here, now that up, 
the contracting team was known as Richmond Line Alliance. So Transport New South for New South Wales had to join with them. We are stakeholders of that contract as well. Then you might think, what's the benefit? Yeah, we'll see. Collective acceptance of project risk. So we share all the risks. Otherwise, what will happen? Contractors will try to pass it to us. Being the clients, we try to pass it to the contractor. So it's an ongoing battle instead of delivering the project. That's a way. So profits based on outstanding performance. Let's say project cost was 236 million. Then we say, all right, if you can innovate and find ways to save, that's a profit. And profit will be shared among all the Alliance team members. So everyone wants to do some innovation and save money. And to tell you the truth, finally, we had a good profit from this project and delivered um, at least one month ahead of the scheduled time duration, so which is great. As well, joint decision on key project issues. It's a collective decision by the team, right? Uh, on resp as well as uh, we had the clear responsibilities and accountabilities, a robust commercial framework, which is all the work have been paid with the reimbursement of direct costs plus equitable fee to cover corporate overheads. Okay? That's how we paid them. Then why an alliance? The project was on a brownfield, that means you know operating rail environment. We can't shut down the trains. As well, at that time, we were in a hurry to offer that contract and complete due to certain reasons. So all this, the entire scope hasn't been decided. So if you don't know the scope, you might think, oh, how do you offer? Yeah, we knew around 80% of the scope, but 20%, there was a gray area. So that's a risk we distributed among the team. So we had to handle it the best way. Then the target completion date to meet new rail corp timetable. Rail corp was the operator of the rent trains. So we had to meet their new timetable. So that was a target. That was one of the reasons we had to start early and finish early to meet this timetable because we can't delay the implementation of new timetable, rail timetable. And there were significant constraints as well as rigid rail possession. Possession means there are around for a year, around five weekends where the trains are not running. So we need to deliver maximum number of risky project, well, the, the construction work during that period, with planning. That's one of the reasons why we went through the alliance because we have the expertise, we in the government, we have the expertise of running our projects during that period. And some of the contractors, although they are bigger, they didn't have that exposure. So we want to share that expertise with them directly as a team. Uh, expectation of a high level of safety and reliability during delivery, that's a no standard thing in all projects in um, New South Wales. An effective and flexible programming of construction sequences. We had to sequence the project the way we wanted to benefit the project. The frequency and duration and continuity of out of hours work. Now it's a regulation there, you can't do any work after six o'clock to disturb the residents. So, but certain days will be allowed for a year, certain number of days. To get those approvals, we had to work hard and get it on time, the frequency, everything. We had a very good system of keeping it under controls. We wanted to share that with the team. That's one of the reasons we went through an alliance, so that we can use our, our expertise as well. Otherwise, it will be a battle between the contractor and them. They say, no, we are not ready. So it's a battle. Right, let's go through innovations, few of the innovations we do. Right, I have seen so many projects happening in Sri Lanka. When you go for the project, one of the major issues is people in the vicinity, they object, isn't it? What's the reason? Is the project bad? No, project is a good project, but they don't know about it. Why? We have not communicated. Someone has not, not, I don't say we, but someone has not communicated to them, right? They're not aware of it. So, how do we handle it? We had a very smart way. Before the project, we did, we made this, printed those cardboard cutouts from trains. So, we went to schools with the kids. We made the trains out of that. 
So they had a souvenir. We made it a tangible experience. We asked them the question, okay, how many of you go to Sydney via train? Everyone. Okay, if you miss the train, do you have any experience? Yes. How many hours you have to wait? One hour. Oh, you think it's a good thing? No. Right. In three years' time, do you know that we are going to run trains every seven and a half hours? Really? The kids ask you. Really? Yeah. So, is it a good thing? Yes. So, we don't have to tell moms and dads, kids will do our job. They carry that model and tell them, okay, there is a positive change going to happen. They share that message. So, before us, they have done that job. And very easy thing, and we have done it. And, but it's thing like we can't live in our prison and say, okay, we are engineers, we are professionals. Yeah, it's true. We need to reach the community, talk to them. And they are part of us as well. Don't forget that. You have to do that, right? So they have done that job. We have given all the, the kids will give the positive message. We, all of us know, kids will always give the positive message, right? Not the negative thing. <laughs> then we strengthen that message with annual tree planting campaigns. We go to each school. We have a tree planting campaign. We sponsor that. It's very cheap. It's not a very expensive thing, right? And we again deliver the same message. Okay, project is in this stage. Get ready on this date. You can go get into the first train. So they love it. Okay, the message. That's one of the. That's how we gathered community support for projects. But still, there are resistances because there are other issues. But however. It's a very good way of uh, um, creating awareness among the neighborhood. Engaging university students, right. And how many of us agree? University students, they create trouble, isn't it? They're always on strike. Every country, not only here. Even in Australia, there are issues, right? And that's the way. Why do they do that? They have a lot of energy. That's the main reason. They have a lot of energy. Can't, is there a way to tap that energy? Yes, there are ways. So, aren't they innovative? Yes. If you can divert that energy in that direction, can we get that result? Yes, we can do. So what we did was, we organized this innovations and sustainability competition for engineering and architecture students of UTS. We asked them, okay, form few groups, six members in each group. It should be a combination of architecture and engineering students. Give us new ideas. We gave up a brief. This is a project. Pick one item. Give your ideas. So they had to do a 15-minute presentation in front of us with their slides. They were creating. They were created models. So many things. And trust me, they was they are so innovative. So they we diverted their energy in a very positive way, and they gave so many solutions for us which we never thought of it, and we implemented. The cost, just $5,000, it's nothing for the awards and simple things. Probably 6,000, 5,000 for awards, probably another $1,000, $6,000, it's nothing. But however, it added value to our project. And finally, remember, in every project, what we are trying to do is to add value to the community. That's what they appreciate, add value to the community. That's how I look at the project. It's not just running a new train, or more than that, adding value to them. So we did that. So which is really good. Right, this is another interesting thing, future proofing. What the hell is that? Future proof. How can you future proof? Yes. Engineers can do anything, I'll tell you. We can future proof. Right. We had a future proof study. That means we think for the next 20 years, we had the projections. If you implement this project, what would happen? How many new people are coming here? What kind of facilities they require? How many new schools they require? What kind of road infrastructure? What kind of energy consumption they are going to do? So we alerted. Engineers, um, uh, we alerted um, uh, Energy Australia. Okay, this is a power requirement. Are you ready? Have you done? What projects coming up? We alerted. They started new projects. The flooding. This may happen. We alerted uh, the council. Come on, go ahead with this project. Are you ready? 
uh, we, we are ready to you know give you the inputs so they started that as well we alerted on um, RTA this is a kind of new road network you require in this area with this kind of growth as soon as we finish the station are you ready so RTA was telling um, uh, don't worry it might take another 50 years to build these roads we said no take our word five years one of the things we had in our mind was right we need to connect, connect Rouse Hill and Richmond with a major road if you go through that it has to cross our rail network how are they going to do underpass overpass whatever they do we decide the okay, best option is going under this so we plan for this we got all the we prepared a uh, rough design gave it to them hey you need this take our word in another five years time we are going to build it. Cost is just six hundred thousand dollars right now. So we will cover it finally with a as an embankment. No one knows. The day you require all the right clearances are there. Everything is there. You just open up and have your road. Are you ready? They were grumbling. So finally, what we did is we use our network. We talked to our CEO. Our CEO talked to their CEO. Their CEO put the pressure. They said yes. Finally, they paid the money. We did it today. Just after a few years, they have opened up. The new road is going. So that's how we did. Right? And we today, if you try to do all that, strengthen the rail network, underpinning all that, how many millions we have to spend? It's big project. But at that time, it wasn't a big project. Little effort, but just trying to see the future. What will happen in the neighborhood? And we provided, we advised the right people, connected, talk to them. So this is the role of an engineer. That's what I think. As I said, when I say engineer, professionals, okay? Keep that in mind, in a broader sense. So, then, one of the very important things beyond engineering, we need to go beyond engineering always, is the management of stakeholders. That's very important. How do you manage? It has four steps. Stakeholder identification, analysis, communications, and engagement, I would say, in a very simple way. So initially, we identified all the stakeholders, starting from the politicians, councils, rail corp. So all these, Energy Australia, Telstra, we had this list. And we identified even the three key people whom we should talk to. And their contact numbers, their email addresses, everything we had. Right? So we used to communicate with them continuously. As well, we did a detailed analysis. This is the matrix we use. We had this power and interest. Agreed. So what we did was like we tried to analyze. For an example, Railco, they, had a, they were the operators. They had the power to stop you on the project. So they came in here. And they had a very high interest as well. How do we manage them? So they have to manage them closely. The so people say from close to that, probably living two kilometers away. They are here. So we need to give some things like flyers and that sort of just the information, basic information to them. Right. So I will go into a bit more details, spend a minute or two on that. So if I focus on that group. Blacktown City Council, that the council area belongs to that. So we have to think of okay, we have to focus efforts on this group involving governance and decision making bodies, engage and consult regularly. For example, with the Blacktown Council, we had fortnightly meetings. During these fortnightly meetings, we had the agenda. We need to give them the design updates. These are the changes happening in this area. Are you ready? So we are going to close this crossing, rail crossing, and we are going to have this um, bridge, pedestrian bridge, the maintenance issues. So we had to talk to them and finally hand over it to them because we can't maintain. So we need to provide the funding for a few years and hand over them. Right? So we had to communicate with them, <coughs> listen to them, and you know, it's a, it's a very smooth process right throughout. Okay, I'll go into communications. Now I'm going to throw a question to the audience. 
How many of you listen to FM radio bands? FM radio bands. Maybe to listen to music, news, whatever. Right. There's one common FM band which everyone tune into. Does anyone know? That's known as WIIFM. What the hell is that? What's in it for me? When you see this notification of this presentation, what did you think? What's in it for me? Otherwise you won't come, isn't it? When you go to talk to your stakeholders, you need to understand. They think of what's in it for me. So during this delivery process, we need to communicate with that. So Blacktown City Council, we our, our strategy was to tell them, hey guys, the land value of your properties will increase threefold within next six years. So what will happen? The rates you are going to charge will multiply. You have to be with us to do that. If you stop it, might it will get late. Okay, so we, it's clear. So every party, we had that message, very clear message to them. So we use this WIIFM principle. That's what's in it for me. When you talk to any stakeholder, keep that in mind. Don't forget it. That's a very smart strategy. You need to understand, first of all, before going to the meeting, we use always plan out. What are, we, what are we going to offer them? We need to know clearly. If you don't know, just postpone the meeting. No point, not worth going for it. It will be a big battle. You're going to waste your time. Don't do it. The rule of three. So always at the end of the meeting, I used to, I did it personally, I always do it, summarize everything into three major points and give them the message. Okay, remember, before next meeting, we need to resolve these three issues. This is your contribution. So that way they remember. Why three? Why not five? That's a human psychology. If you talk about three issues, you remember that. But if I talk about eight things, you have to remember these eight, I'm pretty sure they're going to forget all. But if I give them only three tasks, or they remember that, they will do it. That's a human psychology. Remember that. It's a bit of psychology. Or verify findings by questioning. Um, yeah, always if someone says, a stakeholder says no, never have accept. That doesn't mean no. It is, there is a yes, but there is some issue to take the exact issue and analyze it to understand you need to start questioning in a positive way open-ended questions keep on doing it then you finally get it I'll, I'll give you one of those examples later on keep within scope always try to yeah go with the scope it's very important with our stakeholders I'll wrap up promptly when completed and thank that's very important because you need to show we are not swollen headed bunch of professionals but we are part of you and we appreciate your participation and we really thank you and you are part of them we have to tell them how do you do it you have to thank and you know and finish it off and there are a few um, don'ts as well don't be late don't interrupt while they talk and today to tell you that I was very impressed we started on time on the dot which is really good so that's the way right we had everything here to start on, on time so that's really good and don't use jargon with your stakeholders because they don't understand finally you will be a loser try to understand how you're going to explain say for an example if I try to explain the technical if I try to communicate using too many technical jargons with my stakeholders with the neighborhood they will say thank you very much we don't have time for you they will move on then we can't find any solutions right we can't engage them uh, don't go over time without agreement it's a one hour meeting try to finish at least by within one hour five minutes uh, don't end the discussion abruptly that's important okay few challenges now this is another important area Sorry. 
challenges. Okay, I told you like we had this school communications, everything. But still, there were community objections. But there was a reason. For an example, we moved this station, old station, 800 meters away from the old location. So what about the people living there? They straight away object. Why? The majority of that population was elderly people, senior citizens. Most of them didn't have cars. It's reasonable. We are going to create economic growth. But true. What's the benefit to them? If they have to walk 800 meters to catch the train on a very cold winter morning, can they do it? It's very hard. We, we have, have that empathy. So there were so many objections. As well, politicians were behind them. One of the politicians very openly told us, hey, I'm not going to, you may talk about economic growth, but we are not going to, I'm not going to lose 2,000 votes here. No, we don't allow you to move it. So how do we move it? So finally, we had to talk about negotiate right. So finally, we questioned the people in the area. So what's your real issue? Is that the station? No, our issue is how can we go there? Right. So we had a smart solution. Solution, we sold the idea to the politicians. There was a lot of political pressure on us. We won't allow you to proceed with this project. But however, we resolved. Resolve. And our solution was, uh, we asked the politician, right, your issue is this, but you're, we are going to have a very good economic growth. Do you agree? Yes, they said yes. We agree. Okay. But the real issue is not the project. The issue is they have to walk 800 meters. Do you agree? Yes. The solution is, can we organize free bus service to those people to carry them for one year and within that one year we need to organize the regular bus service connecting that location and the station as part of your rules yes so they did it finally and politicians agreed the same politicians who opposed us during the project came to the opening ceremony and one politician by that time, during the project delivery, um, that politician was in the opposition. They protested. By the time we finished, and that politician was a transport minister. And the transport minister initially said, this is a crap project. But later on, he said, this is one of the wonderful projects. Same person. Right? So that's politician. But we, we can't tell them that. It's not, they have their reasons. But, my message is this, we should be smarter than them, being professionals, being engineers. We need to find a real solution and we should not go behind the politicians but we need to lead them, we should be in front of them. We need to sell our ideas to them, we need to force them to take our decision but we need to prove that we are smarter than them with our actions, not with words. But when we do this sort of stuff and find the solution, they realize, okay, these are a bunch of smart people. I have to listen to them. They give up. Take my word. Right. Um, so we had to do it. So politicians, whether in Sri Lanka or Australia, they are the same people, but there's a bit of difference. They are more educated. So, however, so, and uh, yeah. Okay, then there were environmental issues. So, and we had a peculiar issue. That there were so many environmental issues. One peculiar issue, so during these environmental studies, we found a, a creature known as leeches, kudalas, living in a one area, one small area. We had this new rail track. So what are we going to do? We had to move that by 100 meters. So that was an environmental issue. But we had, we had to take it positively because it's a rare species. So we had to protect them. They're part of this earth. So we need to understand as engineers, engineers are not just putting concrete jungles. No, we are part of the environment. Our solutions should be part of the environment. We had to accept that fact. And there was some explosives. There was another issue. One of the uh, lands we used was belonging to the defense ministry. So they have buried some explosives during Second World War. During our excavation, we found some of them. So we had to hold the project for a few months, do a detailed investigation, and do all that. And finally, yeah, we resolved that issue. We cleared that it's a safe area to go ahead with the 
or with the construction. So we did both. So can you see how we deliver? But however, um, deliver by keeping the big picture in your mind and create the economic growth as well as challenges, how we handle in an innovative way. That's what we did. So, so I was talking of the Schofield station, but however, I thought um, I'll show you a few slides of another project, but I'm not going to take time just to get some idea. You might think, oh, okay, small. No, it's not small. It's a big growth there. And to tell you the land price in that particular area of Schofields has increased by 300%. 300 percent threefold okay so that's a way just after completion of the project from the date we announced the project so that's a way so that's economic growth you know the demand we created that demand being engineers and architects and urban designers and environmentalists as a team so that's a growth we have given so i'll jump into a new project and take around three four minutes and show you a few slides our vineyard station this is one of the key stations in Sydney. And it's all, can you see the pictures? This is the old situation. And wires were hanging all over the place. It's an old station. This couldn't meet the demand as well of people there. Um, just before the renovation, uh, 75,000 people, commuters were using the station on a daily basis. So this is the old station. Now we renovated. OK, this is the plan. Um, of the thing. Um, this is um, vineyard. This is a vineyard station and it was connected to the Darling Harbour via a tunnel. Earlier, if you want to go to Barangaroo Ferry Harbour and Darling Harbour, you had to take around 20 25 minutes walk because you need to cross so many roads. Now, we had this underground tunnel which has a capacity to handle 10,000 people every hour. So it's a huge tunnel, it's a, it's a landmark project, I would say. And um, we completed that project. Um, and today, 150,000 people use the station every day. I'll take you uh, through a few pictures and you will understand that. This is a Barangaroo Precinct, you know, and this is a new modified station. Um, that's another pic after completion of the new station. These are um, yeah, another picture from a different angle. And this is the interface between the vineyard walk and the station. And station finishes there, the vineyard walk starts here. It's underground tunnel. And you can see the beautiful buildings created. And see, it's a masterpiece actually. If you happen to go to Sydney, make sure you visit. Right? Anyone who comes, if you want to take a tour, contact me. I'll, I'll help you. Right? It's a landmark project. I've taken so many people there. Right? So. So a few pictures of that. So this is part of that connecting. Uh, there's open space as well, um, but it's above the road. It's the best situation there. Instead of going under the existing road, we thought we should go that way and connect that part. And again, so finally, I want to give this message to everyone. Think strategically, but act tactically. So that's my clear message. Um, and in delivering projects, don't think we are just building something. No, we are part of this economic growth. Make sure you understand the big picture. Think whatever every simple action you take, connect with the big picture. Okay, then you become part of that as well. I want to finish everything with this saying. This is um, by a Theodore von Kármán. He's a well-known aerospace engineer. He said engineers create the world that never was this is a real truth right so all the good things come to an end so to finish um however uh, before finishing i want to thank this is your turn now questions and answers session this is your turn um, and before finishing i want to thank uh, the isl committee uh, for organizing this um, and big thank to um, all of you Please feel uh, free to ask any questions.
Sir, my name is Arjun Mahathir. Great presentation. The fascinating part of me, actually I've been in this stage of, and I have to wait one hour because there's been one track, you're right. When did you say this was finished? 2012. That's right. So if there was construction going on, I didn't want to go behind it, but uh, yeah. there are stages. Uh, this means that you have been students, children, yeah. cutting off uh, templates and making yeah. engines. In the project, which stage did you start that stage for engine? In the family? Beginning. Very beginning. Before, before digging the floor. Yeah. No one knew about the project. But however, the project has been approved, but it should be approved, otherwise we can't communicate. At the, because we need to start it on the day one. By the time the alliance was, it is, we were in the process of forming the alliance. We started that process. We went to schools and starting the presentations. So that way we engage the small kids. That was the starting point, which we do in every big project there. So this is my asset. I have some of the we like our railways here, and our chairman, mechanical engineer section, told me, yeah, I said, but then it's from railway, we like a railway. Two points. And we have been trying to do this electrification project, and we were in the big hotels, doing a lot of discussion, all the high power people were there. I have never heard, I've, I've been coming to IESL for the uh, lectures for a long time, for now, about seven, eight years. This is the first time I think I could recollect we are a public project where there was so much emphasis on stakeholder management. I hardly hear that. We have to go to the stakeholder management now, we are going to more uh, address uh, that is after the disaster take place. So I really appreciate the effort you are taking. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, as well, I want to add uh, just a word. So it is, um, we need, don't believe in firefighting. We need to be proactive. If the, we are smart people, we are engineers are that, okay? Uh, all the professionals are that. We need to understand. When you create a project, what problems may erupt? We need to find the solutions before that. Okay. And you need to be ready with the solutions. That's very important. I have one question. Now, you were able to do that excellent project in Australia. So, how engineers are unable to do a similar project here? What is the drawback to see in this? I think I have already given that answer in my presentation. Uh, we engineers, we have the skills, but unfortunately, we are prisoners of our technical skills. We need to go beyond that and we need to communicate. Don't have barriers around you. Don't get scared of politicians. Don't get scared of community resistance. But we need to handle it and we need to speak to the community, have smart moves. Say, for an example, selling your project from the day one, it's important. That's very important from the day one. You have to sell it, your project, because you are trying to create that economic growth and people are going to use the project. So, our engineers, I think they can do it probably better than me, I'll tell you. But we need to put some initiative on that. We need to start that process. That's very intention of me to give that message. Don't think we are just engineers. We are smart engineers. We can do better than that, definitely. Yes, can I, can I, uh, you know, uh, what you are doing uh, is like uh, sort of thing that I think that I need to make that more good. Environmental impact assessment. I just want to find out from you now. As the mediation, but we think the that have been really against the southern area, but then we speak. So we let the dream back in general. We have to have the problem with what we had. Now I'm trying the meters and that kind of thing. It's so commonplace here at the border. Maybe we can do that. My question to you is actually when was the EIA done? And you said you were in the schools before, uh, before the ground was done. Fine. Uh, I assume that the EIA was done before that. Now, this is the way EIA we have started before that, for that. But however, it's not completed, it's halfway line. 
So we don't, now in Australia, we do the project, we don't wait until we finish activity and go to next activity. We, because the cost of delivering a project is huge there. So we need to give, one of the concepts we have is to um, give the value for money. To do that, you know, we need to line up, have the right sequence. So initial approval has been taken, that's fine. Then the environment minister finally has to endorse and sign off. That's a final thing, right? Minister's undertaking has to be given. So during that, there is a gap, but that will be done while the design is being done. But however, we can't dig the floor uh, before having the final approvals. But however, project doesn't start there. Project starts on the day contract is awarded and the design starts. The, uh, I'm talking of the detailed design. But during the concept design, we start that process. By the time we go to schools, it's a starting of the detailed design. But by that time, we have done major share of EIA. So just going to the schools and um, yeah. the volunteers and all that was a part of the community part of that. Meeting, was it? Yes. And community consultations, all that. Yeah. Okay. Part of that. Yes. I don't know why some of our students are saying that we don't do it, we do it. We don't do it. It's a it's a normal regulation. Yeah, it's, it's a regulation, I know that, yeah. No. Exactly. Of course yeah. it doesn't happen the way probably the way it should be. Yeah. Can improve, but it's a part of the cycle. Yeah, of course, yes. Yeah. And we are part of the environment, we need to look after that aspect, definitely. Yeah. So that's the Abrangi Visanaka. Abrangi Visanaka is uh, an X ray woman, retired 15 years back, and uh, of course, still in. Still going behind the railways. Yeah. So thank you very much for your very educative and enlightening speech on uh, Richmond line development or rehabilitation and upgrading. So I have, I, I wish to pose a question to you. Uh, did that rehabilitation process originate from the people or from the professionals or from the old or, or was it from was it a, a, a general request or, uh, I mean, a general demand for uh, transport uh, development that made it uh, work? Yeah. And the next question is, I have to show you a complaint. I mean, give you a, I mean, something, some irregularities. That is what is happening here in Sri Lanka. Now, well, in 1999. 5th of May, we signed the Sri Lanka Railway and the Portland Cement Corporation signed an agreement, lease agreement for access, access agreement on a 30 year lease. They are according to the lease agreement, Portland Cement was allowed to run only 5 trains a day. The track belonged to the railway, the building, the signaling, all the infrastructure belonged to the railway. But whereas, and at, by the, at that time, we were running 20 trains a day, passenger trains a day, in that set. Yep. Until January or February last year, we managed to run two rail cars, Mr. Vijay Sekhar, Mr. Vijay Sekhar's rail car, two rail cars up and down, four, four, four times a day, two, uh, two runs up, up way outside, two runs down. Mm -hmm. Now, as it is in 2018 March, not a single passenger train runs. General manager operation is here, so I put this question to it. Not a single train runs as it is. That is because due to pressure of some people, pressure on the authorities, pressure on the railway management, railway heads. Pressure, due to pressure of the, some of the guys, that two trains were also withdrawn. Can I? Uh, so, yeah. I want to know whether the Australian politicians also, when you propose a project, do they ask for a certain percentage of commissions? <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let me start in a different mood. Um, 
and um, Ranjit, uh, I know Ranjit doesn't, does not need a microphone and we were together in Bangkok and he was part of my audience speaking and um, so I met him. He does not need a microphone yeah, actually, right? But I need a microphone unfortunately, right? Um, however, your first question, um, whether who started the process? As I said, it's professionals, not the politicians. The, here, they are the mechanism. We take uh, the initial step. How does it? It's not Transport for New South Wales. It's a growth center commission. But it's another bunch of professionals. Engineers, urban designers, economists, that sort of people. So they were finding a new hub to accommodate the growth of population in Sydney. They found this spot. And they were liaising with Transport for New South Wales. Now, the issue they write correctly, those professionals identified. The issue is transport issue. Can we make it a popular hub? So they identified in la they liaised with us, transport for New South Wales, what kind of solutions you can give. So we gave them the solution, rail duplication, uh, eight trains per hour. So that way, the, the physically it's the same distance, it's 45 kilometers away from Sydney, but we can bring it closer psychologically to people. That means the travel time we can reduce. As well, waiting time there we can reduce. That way we can add a value to the people, people's life there. So that way more people will come there, more businesses will come there. So that's how we started with the Growth Center Commission. Then, yeah, the as usual ruling party promotes it, opposition party objects it. That's a normal game, but we can't criticize them. That's quite normal. That's professional. That that's the game, right? But we should know how to promote it. That's my message. Um, second one, um, I, I think I would prefer to have a chat with you uh, during tea time. I'll give you the right answer. We know each other very well, so we, yeah, I'll give you a reply. Thank you very much. Can you can you please go to my place here? Yeah. I How do you bring it's it's a change management process but however people young professionals like you can do a lot say for an example um, institution of engineers is a good place good playground to do that have now say for an example mechanical and civil committees have joined together and have you know that kind of discussions on different projects because mechanical engineers they have a different view Civil engineers, they have a different view, but finally they come into some kind of agreement in your workplaces, have that. So you need to go ahead with that and it's a continuous dialogue and you need to throw certain issues, projects and have that dialogue. But the problem I can see is most of us don't talk to each other, as you say. We just keep our opinions to ourselves, close to our chest. We don't open it out. We have to open up and talk to everyone. It's finally, um, now when we do a rail project, it's not civil engineer's job, it's not signaling engineer, it's, it's a collective effort of all of us, as well stakeholders. We have to give part of that pride to our stakeholders as well, because sometimes they give us genius solutions. To do that, we need to engage them. So everyone has to do that. As well, I believe in, in universities, we need to teach the communication skills. How do you interact? How do you engage others? That's very important. So from that age, if you develop that culture, you start talking to other people. When you have your opinion, it's not only, don't think my opinion is 100% correct. No, it may be, but who cares? It's finally your contribution to that issue. That's what matters to me. So we need to understand, do we do that? Take the issue that way? Do we handle the issues that way? So that's my question. So we need to develop that culture. So probably we have to start from the schools, universities, communications, 
we need to learn this thing. Right? And when I went to Australia, this was new to me. And initially I was thinking, what the hell, where should we? But when we started coming, I realized, okay, this is the way. And I wanted to master that as well. I was engaged, even the community consultation, some of the engineers, even there, they say, oh, that's not our job. They don't go, but I used to volunteer and go. Even on Saturdays sometimes, Sundays I have been, a couple of them, right? Spend my time and listen to them, resolve their problems. That I really enjoyed. And so, most especially the younger generation has to go through that path. Probably, you never know. You may create that. Contract is that contract is um, agreement between two parties to deliver. You know, there's a um, offer as well as um, I can't remember the exact technical jargon. But how a contract is a sort of agreement between different parties to deliver something. As well, there's a provision for you to leave. Say, for an example, the company goes bankrupt. What are we going to do? So there is a provision. So if someone wants to voluntarily go away, yes, you have to pay some damage and move out that is um, that's quite correct um, there's a provision always in any contract wherever you have that provision as well and your other question was um, yeah yeah it, it's a freight as well as commuters always but freights um, you don't run all the time there are limitation as uh, uh, this are said earlier the five trains in the Kutlam line per day so we have our limitation which I can't remember so we have that program, yes. So both of them, freight as well as that. There was a question from the back yeah. 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 Just one, you have mentioned about the topic sharing. Yeah. I need a question to elaborate more on that. Yeah, it, it's a kind of um, technology on um, this way. So if you, not only profit share, there's a, there are two terms we use, gain share and pain share. Pain share is if you make a loss, all the parties has to bear that loss as well. If you, there's a profit, so we have agreement on our contribution. Say, for an example, during this delivery process, who gives the best, the major share of contribution? The builder, constructor, finally. So he has the maximum. So we have our way of uh, computing that. So that project, say, for an example, that project, uh, my memory says there was a profit of around 20 million dollars right so we would we had to distribute we had agreed ratio on that so transport for new south west certain share um yeah other um skm another share so it works out that way it has been agreed as well it is based on the government finally the government is the funding no 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 the total cost will be paid there's a contract sum we call it stock, total outturn cost, right? It was uh, 236 million. So out of that, what we do is I say there's an innovation. So as a result, there's a term $8 million saving. Right, that's part of the profit. 
right? And finally, when we make all these payments, cost plus overheads, we have the certain share for that. Project has been completed, everything has been cleared, so everyone has to agree with that. So, has been done, that balance is there, because it's an agreement. And um, I took this case study as a classic example because from the day one, we did the things in the best way. And this is not the first alliance in contract, cont contract we had. We had a one before that, it was a mess. So that was the learning process. With that, you know, we mastered our skills. So we had certain forums, we discussed what were the issues, how did you resolve, what were the failures, all that we discussed. So as a result, this went very smoothly very smoothly it's a classic case and we didn't we had issues but we resolve all those issues in the best manner for the project not towards one party not biased towards one party so if you want um during tape break here yeah, we'll have a further share thank you yeah. Yeah. So, at the beginning, I, I gave that, you know, we can't, we have to think in an innovative way, always. When we created a station, if you try to think the same pattern, continue the same pattern of thinking, we can't find the best solution. We have to move away from that. So, what we should do is, like, we need to develop several options. Okay, if you have the station, the base option is, if you have the station there, What's the cost? What's the benefit you get? You need to analyze. And if there's a better place, you know, the team should consist not only engineers, the urban designers, there should be an economist in the master team, right? And we need to throw the questions, right? If you relocate in a certain location where you can develop a new city, what would be the growth? And what's the cost? What's the benefit? So you need to analyze that. That's the initial stage, project development stage. And you need to agree on the best outcome. This is the best outcome to it. It's not doing patch up work. So then you don't offer as professionals anything to the community. You just do a project. That's true. It may be a high quality project as well. Yes, true. But the community, the country, the nation wants is not that. Nation wants is the value addition. Everyone wants a value addition. So we need to think of that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not only um, a product of one discipline. There should be so many disciplines together and deliver that project. Did I give you some idea? Yeah? Yeah. Sorry. I'm Alak Minyasi. Yeah. That's the right part of this task. In GDS, uh, like the like, 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 Competition to select picture lines against other, 
So, what we do here is um, we tender the project. And by that time, we tender the project. By that time, we have identified probably around 80% of the scope. So we put it as a document, our brief, and we provide them, okay, we are going to work this as an alliance. Team up with your designers, rail specialists, signaling specialists, form a team and provide your proposal. And you have to sell it. So we have interviews, say, with initially, all those professionals, we shortlist, we do a tender evaluation shortlist around four or five alliances. Then we fix a date, right? This is your turn. You have to present now. So we allow, we have a workshop, one day workshop with the, their team and our transport for New South Wales team. So we have different experts from different teams. So they need to explain what's their solution, what sort of cost savings they are going to do. They have to, and they have to give their target um, TO stock target outturn cost with those solutions and if there are any ex exclusions they need to list out so it's a document as well as a presentation okay so, so we it's a, yeah it's a tender procedure it, it's a transparent extremely transparent remember so they are in Australian uh, context it should be absolute 100% I would say nothing less than that transparent it's a so I think you have an answer. <laughs> it's a transparent. Second question is, as you may know, there is very, very ambitious project that we have concerned about exclusion, verification yeah. How do you see how that concept that you talked about can be used so that we bring it all our time That is, the ideas about the broader evaluation of impact. Like you are saying, uh, and I guess we can't do a space. I know there are certain ideas, just to people like you like, not like people like here, that people should ask all the whole thing. But how much will we be allowed to do that? I believe that if we can adopt the system that we are talking about, bringing that competition with different groups, professionals, we might be able to do that. Do you think we have any hope for doing this? Um, this is my answer. Actually, I'm not aware of exactly what's a funding source. Now, for an example, in Australian context, the funding source is Build Australia Fund, which is the government source, government investment or funding and financing machinery. So we are not bound to offer this tender to a certain party, to a certain agent from a certain country. I'm not sure about what's your funding source, whether it's Japan or China or US or Russia or whoever, what are the conditions aligned to that. So if the funding, there may be a condition to say, okay, the main contractor, the, if the Japanese government funds and they say, okay, you need to use these things, can't do much, you know, we need to abide by that. So it depends on, we need to look at the big picture and don't think Alliancing is a panacea for everything. No way. It's one way. But whatever the system you do, we can think strategically and design it to suit that condition and get the best from the contract for the benefit of country. So that's how you should do. So if I know a bit of nuts and bolts, I can talk a little bit more. Right? But however, I would like to say now, when you say, um, this electrification so there are a few things you need to understand when you say electrification you need to look at the big picture again and some of the issues i have discussed are very extremely relevant so for an example right now the train runs around avilas disa he knows it very well probably around 40 or 50 kilometers per hour right now the the passenger trains in, in these areas, this, yeah, in the Columbia area. Columbia area is about, well, the maximum permissible speed is different from that of, uh, what do you say, Mr. What's the practical? The, let's, let's throw a figure, that's okay, don't be specific. 60 kilometers per hour. 60 kilometers per hour, right. We have those railway crossings. Now you need to consider, when you electrify, what speed you are going to run? 100? 80? 100. So can we have them? They need to find a solution there. 
Are we going to have overhead bridges or underground, so whatever solution? Then underground, what's the flood situation in that area? Will this under, un go underwater? And the crime situation, then subway. Underground is not preferable. People should see that, you know. So there are so many factors. Not only I can't give a silver bullet on that, but that's a way. As well, when you improve that speed, what about the ground condition? Can the ground condition take up? Is there, have we considered the ground stabilization? As well, stations, are we going to have the station at the same locations? Or are we going to change the location so that it benefits the people, with the best benefit to the people? And the stations, are we going to sell the air rights and raise some money to um, invest part of the project? Are we doing that? I'm just throwing questions so that I can't give a right answer here without knowing the facts. But this is the way, this is how we handle it. We throw all these questions, but there are experts among us who can answer, right? So it's in a forum, you need to start that open dialogue. So then all you get the best solution where you can create that economic growth. Otherwise, what will happen is it will be just another project. So you need to consider all those factors. It's very complex, I'll tell you, but when people get together, you can get a simplified solution, the best solution. So if you don't mind, can you the grid? The power grid and the infrastructure. You had a you had a grid, uh, x axis, y axis, power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The stakeholder management. Yeah, yeah. This one or the other one? Uh, if anyone interested, uh, send me an email. I have uh, given my email. I can give you even my spreadsheets, which I use to evaluation and that sort of stuff. I'm more than happy to help anyone. Hmm? Yeah. So for an example, let's say this um, electrification project, let's say you have to um, acquire a property belonging to a low income groups, yeah? Is that relevant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the 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 low income. Yeah. The problem is that uh, the challenge has to be not thin in front of me to sustainability the order. Uh, sometimes the people doesn't have the proper uh, confidence uh, whether the schools stakeholders are receiving the uh, the kind of yeah. Yeah. So okay. that issue is very sensitive and okay. very difficult to manage the, the future. So you what you say is no one trust. 
the stakeholder. Yeah, non trust. Yeah, I know. So the answer is you have to build the confidence. How do you do it? So the, from the day one itself, you need to be transparent and the right communication, you know, and you have to pinpoint them. Okay, this is what we said and we are doing it. So we need to develop that culture step by step. I know that that can't be done overnight. So for that, professionals have to play a lead role. We need to set an example. Right? So for an example, if someone says, tomorrow, let's say, someone comes here and tell, okay, I'm going to run a car with water. How many engineers, all of us, all the engineers know what it is. But how many engineers stand up and say, no, you can't do because of these reasons. So we need to stand up and build that confidence and prove it. But how many of us take up the challenge? That's the issue. Yeah. As a community, we have to start that process. So people, I know, I know that. People don't have, that's one of the reasons. But who, the day, the, 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 the professionals, the engineers or environmentally, so who start playing the lead role, they can, we can build that confidence. That's what happens there. It's not the politicians, it's the professionals, right, finally. And you, when we talk to them, and we prove them, finally, we, we give the right message. Okay, we are shifting, relocating the station for this purpose. Okay, then they say, no, we don't like it, we hate it, right. Why do you hate? We ask the question. These are the reasons. So we give them a solution, right. It's done. Are you okay? No. Yeah, they're happy. So we need to build that process step by step. I know it's, it's a long march, I'll tell you. You can't do it overnight. It takes a while. I think you'll have a chat during tea break. But, yeah? No. Why should we? Why should we? Because the train, train ticket price depends on our cost and whatsoever the profit or whatever. No. It's a developing economic growth. More people will use the train earlier. Few people use the train. Now, trains are packed. And more income generation from that station earlier. That station didn't give any income. Because people didn't want to rely on that. Now, it's packed. So why should we? No, we should not. That means we are going to add another burden to people. Yes. I think uh, it was a very inspirational talk about the full capacity of smart engineers. Uh, I have this simple question out of curiosity. I would like to know what kind of solution you came up for those uh, the niche problem you had to save the indigenous species. How you actually um, the solution now, that's the way, we really exactly, so when this issue came up, we identified the exact area, the leeches, that area, we identified, so it, it was verified and yeah, okay, we need the area. So one of the rail tracks going, was planned to be gone across that area. Then we shifted, diverted by 100 meters. Okay, we had to acquire more land, that sort of issues were there. But Still, we had to protect that. That was an additional cost. True, fair enough. But we had to do it. So that was a solution. So that species are living. I believe so. I've not gone there. Right? To see that? But yeah, that's the way. So whatever we could do to protect them, we did it as part of our project. We had to do that. Seriously, we had to do that. Okay. And that's one way of building a confidence. Confidence. Because we identified that. We told the people, okay, there's an issue. So therefore, diverting. You have one more question here, yeah? Okay. Um, sorry, can I have your name, please? I'm Upendra Ramil. Upendra, right, I think. 
I think we knew each other some time ago, right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess it should be you, right? Thank you very much, Upendra. Um, so, and um, okay, I'll put it this way. Now, the model we use so far was funding through Build Australia Fund. But however, we can't go ahead with that forever because to fix all the transport issues in New South Wales, in Australia, for the during next 10 years, we need around more than 200 billion Australian dollars. So we need to smart up. So there are new innovative ways to do that. One way is to sell their rights. Now with this new project, which is happening in Sydney, which is, um, uh, what do you call, uh, Sydney Metro project, they are going to have sell air rights, which they are going to do, but I'm not aware of the exact model, but they are going to do that. They have decided and they will do it. Uh, in Chatswood, we have done it, but I don't think that work model was extremely workable. They did it. But there are other ways as well. Say so for an example, that's one of the things people were talking during this Cofields project, that's to buy a block of prime land keep it in our stocks and sell it after four years to developers that way we could have recovered major share of the property that's one way of doing it by the government because government has all the information there may be vacant lands you can buy that block of land and sell it at a premium price once the project is done you can recover major share of the project as well identify projects and have a consortium with the property developers and have high rise structures, whatever, and profit share should come to the government as well. So there are so many other ways. Okay. We finish it off, right? Uh, just a few uh, comments uh, that uh, this uh, important I wanted to put it in. It's very interesting. We have had about uh, five or six transport related activity related, related ventures here in the last uh, three years. We have been focusing on that purely because of this project uh, that we are talking about. Yours is the only one. Ranjit, you would agree. You, you, would, you would agree with what I'm saying because you have been part of our journey on this digital railway ventures here, right? Yours is the only one so that where you have spent 95 or even probably 100 percent of your discussion dialogue about influencing the society and working with the people. There have been many lectures here, they were all very technical, very, very uh, transport related, uh, feed, uh, turning point, gradient, and all these other stuff that So I think that's the key message you are delivering. And the reason I wanted you to put it out here is not because of the four quadrant. What I found was very interesting. Look at the two white arrows. So I will buy the Kandigani railway track. Now we are trying to expand it. The biggest one, two, three problem for me is the squatters. The day they come to squatters, the mission is going to get whacked. So I think they should be talking about the squatters. They are all right along the line. So what is interesting in your diagram is that you are first to address their needs and you okay. make move them to become key players. The only time I have seen this in Sri Lanka is recently on the side of Mishu Baskar and the we brought a Basca and he got announced a disaster, but, but basically they brought a Basca as an influential guy. And the, the least important category you always have to show consideration. I, I found that to be very interesting. This is this never happened. We either satisfy their needs and we leave them there. So what we really need to do is we want to satisfy the needs of the squatters, we need to make them to be key players. So they are the ones along the uh, Cali Valley Railway. Uh, so that I, I'm waiting there for the last 55 years to get that thing going, but uh, still not happening. So you can see how I keep asking myself how the government. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. Engineer Amartunga, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Uh, for enlighten us and uh, provide a great insight to how to manage a project, a mega scale, a complex project, effectively and efficiently obtaining the support as well as engaging the, all the stakeholders in it. Special 
you didn't roll it our heads with tons of theories but shared your valuable practical real life experience and examples so in order to present the token of appreciation to our wonderful lecturer today i would like to cordially invite madam uh, professor uh, niranjani amrit uh, niranjanath naika to the stage Thank you very much. Um, be in touch. That's it.